<clears throat> I'm not what you call a fisherman by any stretch of the imagination. I've been fishing a few times over the course of my 60 years. 60. I remember when I was a kid, my uh, father took me and some of my siblings to one of the local lakes in our community to fish. And uh, believe it or not, that evening we caught 65 white perch. Um, those, those are eatable ones. <laughs> Yellow perch, the little sunnies, no, but uh, the white perch. So that was, a, you know, that was a decent catch for the night, especially when we didn't do it very often at all. Now, my father-in-law um, loved fishing. He didn't go as much as he would have liked, but when he had the opportunity, when he could take the opportunity, he went. In his old study, the one that I'm using now um, for my study presently, there are some fishing mementos that either were given to him or he purchased, I'm not sure which. And they're mainly of fishermen of one sort or another. One of the mementos has this saying on it, gone fishing, just like that, gone fishing. And when I saw that uh, earlier in the week, and I said, you know, that really captures what Luke is writing about here and what Jesus is about in our episode this morning. Gone fishing. There are two words used in the episode for fishing. One for catching actual fish and the other for catching men and women and catching them alive. That's what it means. And this is what Jesus is doing in the story today. Right in the opening scene, Jesus is fishing for men and women through teaching God's word to the crowd. He's at the lake, he's at Lake Gesenaret, which is just another name for the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Luke is being precise, it was a lake. Um, I think, and Paul, you might be able to correct me, I think it's about 13 miles long and um, eight or nine miles wide. It's something like that. Um, and it could be sea-like. It could become, you know, depending on the weather conditions, uh, quite turbulent. But it was a lake. And it's in Capernaum, or it's, Capernaum is around part of that lake. And we were in Capernaum last week when Jesus was in the temple. Well, this day is, you know, out by the lake, doing the same thing. I mean, he's preaching. And, um, and this is where Simon and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, apparently had a successful fishing business. They had, you know, a number of people, not just them, but they had companions working along with them. So it was probably somewhat successful. And Jesus, as I said, is teaching the word of God to the crowd of people at the edge of the lake. It's a big crowd, so much so that they're pressing in on him. I mean, the, um, you know, he's at the edge of the lake and the people are right up to him and pressing in. And so he, he says to Simon, I'm going to get in your boat and I want you to put the boat out a little bit from the shore. And Simon agreed and, and did just that. And so Jesus had a perfect setting, great acoustics. He's on the boat, he's taken his seat, and he continues teaching, can, can teaching the crowd, and more than likely, preaching and teaching what he had preached in the temple or in the synagogue. The good news about the kingdom of God or of the kingdom of God. Jesus is, at that point, looking to catch men and women through that message, the message of the gospel, catching them alive for salvation, as he did 
to probably all of you here. There was some point in your life where the gospel was presented. Someone went fishing, some pastor, some friend, or maybe you were just reading, and you were caught. You came to believe, you, you came to see your sin, and, and you turned from it, and you trusted Christ, and he forgave you, and you became a part of his kingdom, the kingdom community, the church of Jesus Christ. And that methodology continues today. That's how Jesus catches men and women, people that you know, people in your neighborhood, people in your family, people that need to be caught and to begin following Jesus Christ. Well, the fishing expedition is just starting. And after Jesus is done teaching the crowd the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus turns to Simon and says, Hey, Simon, let's go fishing. Put out into the deep water and, and let down the nets for a catch. Well, Simon initially questions a little bit. He respectfully quibbles and he says, Master, my team and I have just gone fishing. We were fishing all night long and we didn't catch anything. And you want to go fishing when the sun's shining, glistening on the, on the lake? Just not the best time. And of course, you know, they're, they're tuckered out. They fished all night long, and as the text says, they were washing their nets. And after you got done washing, you'd mend and, and then fold those nets up and, and stow them away back in, into the boat. Um, and I think, and I think there just may be a little pride here. I mean, what did Jesus grow up doing as a, as a young boy and as a teenager? He was in the carpenter shop. What has Simon been doing ever since he started working, more than likely? A fisherman. Here's a carpenter telling a fisherman what to do. That's how our hearts work, folks. Hmm. But Simon soon acquiesces to what Jesus told him. I don't think this was a long, drawn-out, two-hour ordeal. But there was some questioning, there was some quibbling, and, 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 but then notice what he says. Be, but, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Not everyone could tell Simon. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. More than likely, Simon is just thinking about what happened in the synagogue the other day. When Jesus preached, and man, his words were powerful. They had such authority, and everyone was blown away. And then their demon starts piping up, and, and, and Jesus cast out that demon. Whoa, what power and authority. And then remember out front of Simon's mother-in-law's house? Remember Jesus healed her, made her well, and she, they had their Sabbath lunch. And then that evening, the people started showing up in the community wanting to be healed. And Jesus went out, and once again, with the power of his word and the touch of his hand, those people, one by one, he went to each person and healed them. Simon saw that. So because you say so, Lord, we're going to let down the nets. Let's stop there for a moment. Second-guessing Jesus Second-guessing his words in Scripture is more common than I think all of us would care to admit. You know, there you are reading the Scriptures, and Jesus tells you in his word, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, love your enemies, 
Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And it, I mean, you heard it. And then you know, you're thinking that relative comes to mind, that coworker, and you say to yourself something like, well, I don't know. I think this situation is a little different than what maybe Jesus is talking about here. I mean, the way she treated me, what he said to me, eh, I don't think it quite applies. We know it does, but in our hearts, we talk ourselves out of obeying Jesus. We second guess him. Ever done that? I think I have. I have, not think. No doubt I have. Or, you know, just say you hear, you, hear, you hear a sermon from the words of Jesus where he says in the Sermon on the Mount, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Ah, okay. Jesus wants me to trust him and not worry. Well, I don't think this, I mean... If he, had, I mean, this situation that I'm facing, how can you not worry? And then we just go on ignoring him. Not always. But haven't you second guessed Jesus? It's far better, wiser, and right to take Jesus at his word. To trust what he says and to do what he says. He always, always, no matter your situation, knows what's best for you. You have to trust him. And from that trust, you have to obey him. He knows what's best all the time. Well, Simon obviously came around, and after a proud pause, the whole team, including Jesus, got out of the deep water, out to the deep water, they lowered the nets, and bang! They have the catch of a lifetime, a huge haul. In fact, as the text says, I mean, their nets were ripping. And so they called for the other guys to come over and help. And they filled the two boats, boats that are about 27 feet long, 8 to 7 feet wide. And they filled them. And the boats were beginning to sink. With that nature miracle performed by Jesus that day, Jesus catches the heart of Simon Peter. Simon Be Peter at that moment becomes a true disciple. Christ reeled him in. He captures his heart. And it says here, right, I mean obviously, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, I am a sinful man. Powerful response. See what Jesus did that day? Jesus the carpenter's son enters into the fishing world of Simon Peter. And in that world that Peter was so familiar with, Jesus enters and reveals his holy power and wisdom and authority, the Lord over the sea and over the fish. And Peter, who questioned Jesus for a moment, has his heart opened up by Jesus, showing Peter just how much of a sinner he was when he confronted him with his wisdom, his holy power and authority. His life was changed. This was a major turning point, obviously, in Simon Peter's life, as well as the other guys. They were astonished, too. The business partners, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, 
the other guys that were working with them, they were all dramatically changed. Simon leads the way, as he does all through as a disciple. To become a true disciple of Jesus Christ, a person, a sinner, must be convinced that he or she is a sinner and truly convicted of it. That's what repentance involves. That inner reality is taking place as the Spirit of God is opening up that person's heart and mind uh, to the gospel. A person must be convinced that he or she is a sinner who sins against the holy God, and then they acknowledge that that's true, and they turn away from it, and then they turn in faith to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And you who are professing disciples today, remember that about repentance, because repentance, as I said when I preached that sermon about John the Baptist and his ministry, repentance is not just a one-time thing. It really is to be a daily or a regular part of our lives because we're still sinners. And when we find ourselves playing around with sin, tripping and falling into it, and we get, are convicted of it, we need to then acknowledge it and then by faith turn away from our sin, repent of it, and turn to Jesus Christ and he's there to forgive you as one of his brothers and sisters. We are united to him by faith. And I think another important point to emphasize here, the repentance came in, 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 and the conversion in Peter and his repentance came when he was face to face with Jesus and while we can't be face to face with Jesus, we can be face to face with him through the scriptures. The scriptures are what define life and define what's righteous and unrighteous. And so it just underscores the importance of being in the scriptures so that God through his word and spirit is speaking into your life and defining things for you and, and reminding you about things so that there is conviction when there needs to be, repentance, and then a turning toward Christ in true sincerity. Well, Simon's powerful turning point not only involved what appears to be his conversion into a real disciple, but Jesus also called him, as well as James and John, and perhaps Andrew here, into a whole new fishing career. Fishing for people, for men, for women. Luke said, then Jesus said to Simon, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. What is Jesus doing when he says to Simon, don't be afraid? Well, you just saw what happened. I mean, he was powerfully confronted. And when you're in the presence of God like he was in the, in the person of Jesus, a fear, a trembling, an awe and a reverence, but a trembling. And so Jesus says, Simon, don't be afraid. You're forgiven. That's in essence what he was saying. You're forgiven. Everything's good now. And then Jesus says, you're now part of my fishing team. You're going to join me. We're going to fish for people. We're going to make disciples. And the disciples, beginning with Peter and James and John and, and all the others in time, they practice a catch and release strategy. They would go on to preach the same good news of the kingdom that, that Jesus has been preaching here. And they would catch sinners from the, 
from the depths of the sea of humanity's need for a saving relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And upon catching them, they would be released, set free from the bondage to sin and to be able to serve Jesus Christ. And my, and my did they catch a lot of men and women through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter two, Luke says, those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Luke says a bit later in Acts 5, 14, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Man, that would be a nice catch today, wouldn't it? 3,000 people walking through this door? Ah, boy. This obviously was a, a unique situation at the time in redemptive history with Christ being on the scene and establishing his his team of disciples who would, he, he would teach and prepare for when he's gone and so on, and they would carry on be as apostles and so on and so forth. Short of that, though, as disciples of Jesus Christ that make up Redeemer Church, fishing for people is part of the work that we are to be about doing as a church, and then you as individual disciples. You know, we come and do what we did this morning. We came to worship God. That's what disciples do. They worship their creator, their redeemer, and their king. Their servants, their followers, and they adore him. They grow to become more like the man they're following, Jesus Christ, the God-man. They grow and mature over the, co the course of their Christian lives as they repent of sin and then turn in faith and, and renew their commitment to Christ and follow him to become like him in character and conduct. And they multiply. They go fishing. Fishing for men and women who are in the deep sea of need for Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We need to be going fishing, people. We need, to go, be go, we need to be going fishing for people. Unless we do, you're not going to catch many fish. Now, I don't know when it was. A few years ago, I was watching a television show on fishing. I don't know why, but you know, that's where it, the channel sort of landed. And uh, it was a story about flying fish. Really. I mean, they would obviously swim in the water, but then out of the blue, they'd go... And then they would, you know, fly back into the, to the water. But sometimes, I mean, they would fly into the boat. I mean, sometimes that happens, right? Um, when it goes, people come in and, you know, and you don't have to do much work. But otherwise, I mean, you've got to go fishing to catch fish. One commentator, Norval Gildenheis, I thought said it well, and I'm just going to quote what he said. He says, you know, as a church, we must launch deep and there cast the net of the gospel, not only in the church, but in the deep waters of the world. When the church is obedient in this, men will be caught. Her work will bear fruit. It not, it's not going to be 3,000 and 5,000 or whatever. Typically, one, two, three, here and there in the context of your relationships. Maybe in a service, somebody's invited and they hear the good news and, and they're saved. Now, to, to be effective fishermen, to be fishers of men, to catch people alive for Jesus, notice what Simon, Peter, and James, and John did. At the end of verse 11, Luke writes, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So they, they, they didn't, you know, load their boats up and haul them around every town they went to with all their nets and fishing tackle and everything, going from, you know, town to town preaching about Jesus. They didn't go carrying all that stuff. They left it behind. 
so that they would be unencumbered in order to do what Jesus had just called them to do, to fish for men and women using the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not saying you've got to leave your house and your job. That's not the point here and how it applies to us. But some of you may be carrying around sin, sin that you are relishing and involved in and not repenting of. Well, that will kill your desire to go fish for men. If that's you this morning, you've got to repent. You've got to let that go. And Jesus will say to you, don't be afraid. You're forgiven. Others can be burdened down by unforgiveness. That's so uncommon. That's so common, I should say. We go around carrying grudges and, and bitternesses, and, and uh, that dries you up. It really does. You know, you're always thinking about that person. <clears throat> Name comes up, you go, uh, you know. Well, that, gotta, that kind of thing needs to be left behind. You need to go to that person and talk to them and say, hey, I forgive you, or would you please forgive me? I remember once on vacation, I don't know where it was, how far long ago it was, I remember I went to a small store to buy something that we needed that day, got out of the car, walked down the sidewalk, and walked up the steps only to see a sign in the window, gone fishing. You see, in order for them to go fishing, they had to lock the door and turn out the lights and put that sign up. And they went for a day or two, I don't know. But they had to do that if they were going to go fishing. Well, church family, how about we go fishing? Fishing for men and women in the sea of humanity's need for God. We need to do that as a church, and we all need to do it as independent or individual disciples of Jesus Christ. It's what disciples do. Father, thank you for catching us through the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. It's the good news that uh, is the power of God unto salvation. Father, thank you for saving us, and, and Lord, help us to be thoughtful in this regard and to listen to you and not second-guess you. We are to be about making disciples, going fishing for men and women, who need Jesus. Help us to do that and bless the efforts that we make, whatever they may be. In Jesus' name, amen.